Hey guys, it's Krista Watson here from Krista Quilts and I'm excited to tell you more about how I made my bling quilt you see behind me. This is actually a brand new layout from my original bling quilt pattern. It has something similar in the pattern, but I've added enhanced pattern notes showing the new layout. So go ahead and grab a copy of the pattern and follow along and you can make this fun quilt too. For this tutorial, I'm excited to share a few tips on making the bling hashtags quilt from start to finish, including piecing, basting, quilting, and binding by machine. The original bling pattern layout calls for fat quarters plus one background fabric. However, the pattern also includes this bonus hashtag layout made from 10 half yard cuts of dark saturated prints for the blocks and 10 half yards of lighter, low volume prints to make the scrappy background. I'm working with fabrics for my black, white, and bright collection from Benertex, but you can choose any fabrics that have high contrast to get a similar look. And the best part is, you can use up some of the leftovers on the back for twice the fun. Here's a tip when working with fabric yardage. Fluff it out and let it hang straight in front of you before cutting. If you see a warp in the fabric, gently slide the front or back section back and forth until it hangs straight. When working with fat quarters, I like to starch them before cutting. So here's how I do it. I'll lay a couple of them out on my big board that sits right on top of my ironing board. First, I will spray starch on one side of the fabric and let it rest for a few seconds so the starch can penetrate the fabric. Then I'll flip it over and iron from the opposite side. Next, I'll spray starch the side I just ironed and flip it over again to iron it a second time. This gives the fabric some body and stiffness which results in more accurate cutting and piecing. I'm using a hot dry iron with no steam. Follow the pattern instructions to cut out the block units for the size quilt you are making. For my twin size shown here, that's 80 large squares, 80 small squares, and 160 each of the light and dark rectangles, since you'll need twice as many of those for the blocks. I recommend laying out all of your cut units into position right next to the sewing machine so that you can easily sew a whole bunch of them at once. At this point, you can decide whether or not you want your bling blocks to be made from just one dark fabric, or if you want to mix up the pieces for even more scrappy fun. Joining the blocks is pretty simple, and I recommend sewing all of the same units at the same time. I like to sew with a smaller stitch length, 2.0 on my machine, and I press the seams open. This will make the blocks lie super flat so that they are much easier to machine quilt later. Once the blocks are made, grab four of them with the same dark fabric and rotate them to make one hashtag block. Then take your time laying out all of the hashtag blocks into a pleasing color arrangement. At this point, I'll take a picture so that I can refer to it while I sew everything together. Finish the top by sewing all of the large blocks together and then use leftovers to create a pieced scrappy border around the edges. I combined a whole bunch of leftovers to make the pieced back. So here's how I did that. First, I sewed together all of the scrap pieces that were roughly the same size. I made several different larger units from all of the smaller leftovers. The backing needs to be about a few inches larger than the top on all four sides. As I finished each of the similar size segments, I pinned them to my design wall on top of the piece top and started filling in the gaps. When sewing these larger sections together, I like to pin generously and use a stiletto to keep everything aligned properly. I'll take the smaller sections and create larger panels until my whole piece is big enough. Now that the backing is finished, it's ready to baste. I like to spray baste my quilts. I start outside and generally spray the entire backside of the quilt top with a can of 505 spray. I'll set that aside and repeat this process for the quilt back. Then I'll bring the layers inside and assemble them on my design wall. I'll use a long ruler to help smooth everything out too. Next, I add the batting, which has been cut so that it's just a few inches larger than a quilt top, but smaller than the backing. 
I'll smooth it all out so that it will stick to the backing nice and tight. Smooshing everything together will prevent the quilt from shifting while quilting. Then I'll do the same thing with the quilt top, smoothing and smooshing it all together so it's all stuck. I can squish some of the long seams into submission with a long ruler so that everything is nice and straight and square. Next, I'll trim up the edges around the quilt so that there's only about an inch or two of batting and backing sticking out. Finally, I'll take the whole thing to my ironing board and press it with a hot, dry iron. I press the backing first so I can work out any bubbles or wrinkles. I'm using that big board placed on top of my ironing board to give me more room to work. Then I'll press the entire quilt on the front side too. I'll be quilting a design called Shattered Lines randomly across the quilt top. First, I'll stitch in the ditch between most of the major seam lines to anchor and secure the quilt. I like to start stitching on the right hand side of my quilt and work my way towards the center. Then I'll rotate the quilt 180 degrees and pick up in the center again and work my way back over to the right side. I'll rotate the quilt again so that I can anchor quilt some of the lines going in the other direction. I'm working my way from the right towards the center, rotating the quilt again and finishing from the middle back to the right. Once the quilt is secure, I can quilt as many random straight lines as I want to. I'll quilt some of the diagonals across the quilt, but not all of them. The key is to scatter the lines every which way to add interesting texture to the quilt. Next, I'll show you how this translates to the actual quilt. Remember, my quilting plan is just a suggestion and I can deviate from it at any time. And I'm excited to tell you more about how I quilted my bling quilt behind me. So grab a copy of the quilt pattern so you can make the quilt top and then check out and see how I quilted this fun quilt with my walking foot. I'll be using black and white thread for my variegated collection from Aurifil. One spool will be enough to quilt the entire quilt, including the bobbin. I'll begin by stitching in the ditch using my Bernina dual feed mechanism and the 20D foot. It has an open toe for greater visibility so I can see what I'm doing. This is the same function as the walking foot so that all layers of the quilt feed through evenly. Remember, I'm working my way from the right towards the center of the quilt, so I'll scrunch and smush the extra quilt under the throat of the machine to keep it out of my way while quilting. As long as the area I'm quilting stays nice and flat, I won't have any issues with puckers or skipped stitches. Now I'm quilting some of the diagonal lines. I can either mark these or eyeball them, and I'm not aiming for perfection here. Because these fabrics are so busy, any slight wobbles won't be noticeable at all. I've reduced my presser foot pressure to zero so I won't get any puckers while quilting. My feed dogs are engaged so that the machine is doing most of the work of pulling the quilt through the machine. Just remember, this is walking foot quilting, not running foot quilting. Here's a real-time view of what it looks like when I'm quilting. Notice how the quilt rests on the nice big drop-in table while I scrunch and smush the quilt under the machine. As I stitch, I'm only focusing on the area right between my hands. That's maybe about 5 to 10 inches at a time. I'll make sure the needle stops in the down position each time I need to stop and start. As you watch, notice how often I stop and reposition my hands and the quilt. I actually spend more time shifting the quilt than I spend time quilting it, and that's totally okay. Here are some bonus tips to share while you watch me quilt. All of my seams have been pressed open, which makes it a lot easier to stay in the ditch. Contrary to popular myth, this will not weaken your quilt at all, so don't worry about it. Whenever possible, I like to quilt a continuous line all the way across the quilt. If I can start stitching in the batting on one side of the quilt and end in the batting on the other side, then I don't have to worry about hiding my thread tails since the edges will get trimmed away before I add the binding. If I run out of thread or break a needle or something, then I'll need to hide my starts and stops. You can tie off your ends if you want to, but honestly, the easiest way to fix this is by putting in a fresh bobbin and then pulling the thread to the top right on top of a previous line of quilting. Start and end with a series of teeny tiny stitches and it won't be that noticeable at all. If you know that you're going to start and stop quilting several times throughout the quilt, you can plan so that your start and stops are in a seam where it's much less noticeable. Machine quilting really is relaxing for me. I like to listen to an audiobook or a fun quilting podcast and really get into the rhythm of the stitching. 
Just remember, the easiest way to hide imperfect quilting is to surround it with more imperfect quilting. Here's a speedy view of what that looks like from the other side of the machine. Notice that most of the bulk of the quilt is off to my left. The quilt block guardrail at the edge of my table will keep the quilt from sliding off and causing any drag on the quilt. Again, I'm constantly fluffing the quilt to keep the area under the needle flat. Picture hills and valleys. The hills are the quilt that's sticking up around the area you are quilting. And the valley is the area in between your hands that you are stitching. This part stays nice and smooth. Once I've reached the center of the quilt, I'll rotate the quilt 180 degrees and continue from the center to the other side. From my vantage point right here, all of that bulk on the left has more quilting on it than the part of the quilt that's under the arm of the machine on the right. Now I'm working my way from the center of the quilt back to the other side to add more quilting to the right hand side of the quilt. I'm quilting more straight line ditches all the way across the quilt because these are really easy to do without marking. I'm basically using the seam lines as a guide for where to stitch. My original quilting plan didn't have these extra lines marked on it, but I decided to quilt more lines because I was having so much fun and I really enjoy the dense texture of lots of stitching. Just remember, you're the boss of your quilt, so you can change things up anytime you want to. Once I've quilted all the horizontal, vertical, and diagonal lines, I'll mark a bunch of straight lines at random angles using painter's tape. I'll stitch all of these lines, remove all the tape, and then reposition it to create more interesting angles across the quilt. The important thing is to not overlap the tape or that will be so difficult to stitch through. When using painter's tape, I prefer to line up the edge of my foot next to the edge of the tape. Notice how I've moved my needle position so it's all the way over to the right of the foot. This will give me wider spaced lines. If I want my line to be right next to the tape, then I'll move my needle back to the center and stitch with the needle right next to the tape. You have to be a little careful though not to stitch through the tape. I only do that if I want exact line placement. But since this design is random, the needle position doesn't really matter. stitching on the other side of the tape and my needle position has shifted all the way to the left. Be sure to use a zigzag throat plate if you are changing needle positions, otherwise you'll break a needle and we don't want that to happen. Again, I'm moving my hands as I go so that my quilting rhythm is nice and even. I like my stitches to be a little longer when walking foot quilting, so my stitch length is set to 3.0. Another way to quilt random straight lines without marking is to use a guide bar. I put the guide next to a seam line or a previously stitched lines and follow the guide across the quilt to the other side. I used a combination of stitching in the ditch, eyeballing the lines, painter's tape, moving the needle position, and a guide bar. Just use whatever tools you have on hand and it will all work out. And here's what all that perfectly imperfect quilting looks like. I'm going to sew this binding to the quilt completely by machine. Refer to the bling quilt pattern for the total number of strips to cut. Trim up the quilt so that all edges are flush. I like sewing straight seams when making a scrappy binding like this. Press it in half wrong sides together. First, I'll attach it to the back of the quilt instead of the front leaving starting and ending tails. Make a crease at the corner and stop stitching one quarter inch away from the edge. My foot has a marking on it so I know where to stop. 
sew off the corner and do what I call the funky fold. Lift up the edge of the binding so it's in line with the quilt vertically. This will naturally create a diagonal miter at the corner. Fold the binding right back down on itself. The excess will tuck right into the fold. Yank on the starting threads and begin stitching at the corner again all the way along the side of the quilt until you get to the next corner. Repeat this for all four corners of the quilt. Leave yourself enough of a tail so that the two ends will overlap and trim away some of the excess if needed. Open up the starting tail and lay the ending tail on top of that. Mark the line where the starting tail rests. Then measure and cut a half an inch away from this line to account for seam allowances on both tails. I know it's hard to see the marked line on this busy fabric, but trust me, it's there. Pin the two ends together and then join them with a quarter inch seam. I'm using my quarter inch dual feed foot for precise seam allowances. I'm using leftover two inch wide strips so that my binding will finish exactly one quarter inch wide on front and back. Finger press the seam, fold the rest of the binding wrong sides together, and finish stitching down the rest of the binding. This creates a very flat binding with no lumps and bumps. Fold the binding over to the front of the quilt and hold it in place with binding clips. To miter the corners, fold the bottom edge down first and then the top. They should be folded on opposite sides on the other side of the quilt. This will help distribute the bulk at the corners. Now I'm going to top stitch the binding on the front side three separate times. I'm using the same variegated thread that I quilted with and just a regular straight stitch. For the first pass around the quilt, I'm stitching very close to the left edge of the binding. This will secure the binding in place all the way around the quilt. I'm not at all worried if the stitching is hitting in the same place on the back. To me, the front is more important. I'm removing the clips as I go, and the stiletto helps me keep everything nice and straight. For the second pass around the quilt, now I'm stitching pretty close to the right edge of the binding. This is purely decorative but the more stitching I add, the less you'll see any individual wobbles. As I stitch around the corner, I'm making sure to stop with the needle in the down position and rotate the quilt. For the third and final pass around the quilt, I'm stitching in between the other two lines. I'm just eyeballing the distance since the lines are pretty close together. I'm using straight stitches, but you can totally do this with a decorative stitch instead. You could keep going and adding more line of stitching if you want to, it's completely up to you. Going around the corners can be a little bulky, so I'll use the stiletto to give it a good push as needed. When I began stitching, I started with a few teeny tiny stitches to lock the threads in place. I'll do the same thing at the end and then clip off the excess thread. My goal is to help you enjoy making the entire quilt from start to finish, so be sure to visit me online to grab the pattern and supplies to make this quilt. And stay tuned for more quilting videos. So there you have it, my finished hashtags quilt made from my bling quilt pattern. The front and back were so fun to make. Here are a few more beauty shots for you to enjoy. Let me know if you make this quilt and how it turned out. Happy quilting, friends.